Good morning. My name is Harold Cole. Uh, I uh, served in the Second World War in the early 40s. Uh, Germany was uh, bombing all our freight ships in the Atlantic Ocean that was taking war equipment over to Europe to the English and the French who was fighting the early part of the Second World War. And, and you know our freight ships do not carry weapons and everything, so they were very, very brave men in my estimate that sailed these ships and took these equipments in there and knew that the wolf pack, they called the German wolf pack in the Atlantic Ocean, was sinking a number of ships. So in 1941, Japanese uh, bomb, bomb Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was a surprise to all the world that they bombed Pearl Harbor because their representatives was in Washington talking to President Roosevelt at that time. And then they left, and just as they left uh, California, it was December the 7th, and they bombed Pearl Harbor. So when they bombed Pearl Harbor, the United States declared war on Japan, uh, Italy, and Germany. And uh, every brother American, young or old, uh, ran to the recruiting station to list in the, in the military to uh, contribute to the war effort. So in 1942, I was still going to school, but I was when I was 17, uh, me and about three or four other friends of mine that hung out together decided that we wanted to try to get in the military. But we were too young, so our parents had to sign for us to get in the Army. An uncle of one of my buddies also kept telling us about the Buffalo Soldiers, so when we, we decided to go in, we, they asked us where we wanted to go, and we told them that we wanted to go into the cavalry. So they shipped us to camp up to New York. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history that we, you should know, is that in North Pelham, New York, where I was born, there was no segregation. Everybody did the same thing. We went to school with the whites, Chinese, whatever, and we played ball. We ate at each other's house. We stayed at each other's house. We slept at each other's house. And there really was no segregation. And it was a surprise that my mother and father never preached segregation in our family at all, never in my house. So uh, when I got to Camp Upton and we did all our presentations and orientations and stuff and got our uniforms, our haircuts and our physicals and stuff, uh, we all did it together with the white soldiers. Was no, but that night when they sent us to our barracks, the white soldiers went one way, and the black soldiers went another way, and that when we got to the barracks, we knew that that was segregation, and it was really a low blow to uh, most of us New Yorkers. So that was a big experience for me. And through these things, as, 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 as a black man goes, when he runs into these things and, and it makes him feel bad, he gets stronger and he's able to do more than he thought he could do. They took, put us on a train, about 500 of us New Yorkers, and they shipped us to Four O'Clock, Texas. Uh, that's in uh, Brackersville, Texas. Second Cavalry Division, which was all Buffalo soldiers, uh, two brigades went to four o'clock and two brigades went to Lockett. The tenth was in Lockett and the ninth was in uh, four o'clock, Texas. 
So we did our training there. And uh, when we first got there, we trained on the, there was only one uh, fort there, four o'clock. It was, had stables and everything. We were in the regular barracks and we had our own stables there. And uh, as we were training, they were building another part of four o'clock. On the other side, we call them uh, tar paper barracks. And uh, when they completed that, they moved us out of there. We didn't have the privileges, being that we were black, as going to the theaters and uh, medical service was uh, different than it was for the white man. We didn't get to go to the hospital like they did. And we had a lot of restrictions as far as dining and, and uh, entertainment and stuff like that. We had a lot of weapons, but all of them were old. We had six shooters that uh, they used years and years ago. The 45 was out, but they didn't give us one. They just gave us the six shooters. And the same happened to the rifles. We had the old three rifles when they had the M1s out, and they didn't give us the M1s until maybe uh, a year later. Same with the pistols. Our horses were, I would say, maybe, I would say maybe about 99% effective. Some people say they were less than that. We did all our basic training, and after we finished that, they give us a, a D-series training, which was training for combat. They moved us out. They put us, they put us aboard ship and put us outside, and we stayed on the ship for about a week or so. Then we moved to, then they sailed us. We was on the troop ships. Uh, these troop ships, one of them named Hamilton, which we was on, uh, they didn't, we didn't sail in convoys because the troop ships were too fast. They were faster than submarines. And after we got to North Africa, uh, maybe about a week or so, they disbanded the cavalry units. I'd like to tell this little story of mine because maybe you get a laugh at it. When the first sergeant told us to take our platoons and the men out to a mountain that was not too far out there, but it was all rock and everything, he said, I want you guys to dig a foxhole. So everybody was complaining because we didn't have no equipment to dig in the rock, so all we had was the bayonets and, and our shovels, and they wasn't uh, really equipment to dig into rocks. So everybody was telling the first shirt that we couldn't dig a foxhole. So that night everybody went to and then uh, in their own pads and it's because we had these little tents and uh, about four o'clock the Germans came over and bombed Oran, North Africa and that's where we was at and uh, it was pretty bad about six o'clock that morning when it got light I woke up and I looked around and everybody had a foxhole, including me. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool, you know. These uh when I said that when a black man uh gets something wrong, that was he do do more than he thought he could do. So when Jerry came over and bombed, that's another incident where he <laughs> where he did more than he thought he could do. He could dig that hole in, in that mountain. Like we had tank outfits over there with Patton 761st that were there. And we had 
the second, the 92nd Infantry Division was what's a Buffalo Soldier Division that came in Naples at the same time we was in Oran. And they were under strength, so a lot of the Buffalo Soldiers went into that outfit. And then they made service troops out the rest of us, you know, uh, driving trucks, loading and unloading ships and so forth, things like that. So uh, I was lucky. Well, I didn't get really lucky until after we left. We left North Africa and went to uh, Sicily. And we did the uh, mop up duty there in Sicily, which wasn't bad. Every military man that went into Italy went to Anzio first because the Germans had these big guns on rail cars, and they was beating the hell out of the Allied troops. So finally they got the, their air raids and stuff in there, and they knocked out the bombs and stuff, and so we went to Maples. And uh, when we got to Maples, they uh, had most of us working on the, on the docks. The 92nd, when they when they shipped them over there, was for the reason to to fight up in the mountains because the Germans had a hole up in the mountains, and and the Fifth Army under General Mark Clark couldn't move or couldn't do nothing. So what they did is that they brought the white troops down, and they put the black troops up there in the mountains to fight. So, being that they wasn't qualified and everything, a lot of them uh, got died and got shot and stuff. And so, uh, I made one trip up there and I came back to Maples. When I come back to Maples, they put me on a ship. and. They had a Belgium ship out there in the Mediterranean, and we stayed out there about a week. Then we sailed into southern France, and we went on the invasion of southern France there. So we really didn't stay there too long, because when Patton got there, he went through France, Germany, and he went so fast that he, that the supply line couldn't even catch up with him. So <laughs> after the after the invasion of southern France, the war wasn't wasn't gonna last. They knew that the law war was just about over, so that's why they shipped us up there for garrison duty and stuff like that. We were the the only thing about that was bad for the black soldier because all the supplies and everything uh, were run by the German prisoners and the black man couldn't get into the supply depots and stuff because they had the Germans there already and they were, they were the, the prisoners of war were treated better than we were. May, of, May 7th of 1945, I think the war was over. They asked me, did I want to re-enlist or get discharged? Well, at that time, I was a young man, and one of my biggest griefs was what they telling me, when to get up, when to go to bed, when to do this, when to do that. And uh, I says, I ain't doing this no more, so I told them I wanted to get out. So they discharged me out of the Ninth Cavalry. And uh, I stayed out for a few years, uh, and that was the time. That was my time in the army. I would like to say uh, that this country, to me, did amazing things to con to win the Second World War with all the people in the country that. Were con was mining, working in the factories and stuff to get the weapons done, uh, raising money 
for the military and stuff like that, working in the USOs and stuff. There was a whole lot of um, things that they did to uh, contribute their efforts to, to the war. And I thought that was very good. The black outfits they had in the Second World War, uh, you can say in 19, from 1941 to 1946, I would use that because after that it was clean up time, but it, at that time between 41 and 46, we had a lot of black outfits fighting in, in, in Europe and nothing was never said about it. And even when they, they put the, in 19, I think it was 1950 or something, they, they celebrated the Second World, the outfits in the Second World War and the soldiers, and they never did mention a black man at all. And so, uh, Whoever was the uh, Waters, Representative Waters, a, a black lady from Los Angeles, was on the Armed Service Committee. And she started uh, checking into it and everything and come and found out that they had to give us a whole year of recognizing the black soldiers in the military. And then they did a study because they didn't have no Medal of Honor winners as black in the Second World War. And they researched that and we got, uh, I think, five black Medal of Honors out of that. And uh, these things still go on. This is 1917, I mean 2017, and it's still not in the history books. It's not in the school books. It's nowhere mentioned, but just what we do as the Buffalo Soldiers is go from school to school and uh, tell them about the history of the Buffalo Soldiers as I'm doing with you now. And I greatly appreciate it. I lived in New Rochelle at that time, New York. And my father was manager of uh, some property there. And we were sitting in front of one of the buildings at that time when the, the heard it on the radio. It was going on when we heard it. And uh, the whole country heard it then. It was really a, it was really an, a, a, a really bad day for the whole, everybody in America because everybody heard it. It was on the radio. You know, so I was in France and I was traveling from Carentown to Paris. And I passed by a town called St. Lo. And I've never seen a city flattened, completely flattened, everything gone. St. Lo was the town, and that stuck in my head, and it still does today. The uh, Germans said that they would be back in France by that Christmas of 45. And uh, the Allied forces was dwindled with the combat troops, you know. It, it was getting low, they didn't have it. So when the Germans surrounded them at the Battle of Bulge, they went and asked the black man, the black soldiers, to volunteer to fight in combat. So we had 5,000 black men that volunteered, and they used maybe a 1,000 of them. The thing that they did was that the 1,000 that volunteered, they had to lose all their rank whether they was a master sergeant or what, they had to lose all their rank. And because they didn't want them commanding white soldiers. And, and the funny thing about it, after the war was over, they never got their rank back. That's, that's the part I want to tell you about St. Lowe. 
I was up and like I told you, they moved us up to Cherbourg and like in Garantown, France, uh, because the war was the war was almost over, and we were doing garrison duty, and uh, it was we were in town that day, and they, the guys kept telling us the war's over, the war's over, so. We, when we went back to the to our company, the old man told us that the war was over and that uh, we're going back home on the point system. Because everybody thought they was all going back together like we came. But they had to use the point system. And the point system was... Uh, how long he was overseas, how long he was in the service, and all different points for different things. It was a very beautiful feeling, you know. It was very beautiful to know that the war was over. I'll have to tell you that. Inside, I can't express how I felt. As far as I'm concerned, as far as changing, I was young, and I didn't know what I had uh, in front of me if, I, if it wasn't for the war or, you know, at my age, the war come, it was just a part of our life, you know. So uh, I didn't know uh, what uh, it was for changing. It's just that after the war was over, I knew that I was going to do bigger things and better things. That's what I knew. And that's what happened to me. I'd like to tell you about how the Buffalo Soldiers was formed. The story began in 1866, 150 years ago. The American Civil War was over, the Union is preserved, and the Institute of Slavery is abolished. The nation is trying to heal itself. The former Confederate states are enacting a series of discriminatory and restrict the black codes to keep former slaves from participating in a free society. The victorious Union Army is being demolished and reorganized. Westward migration of settlers is on increase. Native Americans are seeing their land occupied by outsiders and most of them resented it. An act of Congress called for reorganization of the Army. It authorized the formation of two regiments of cavalry and four regiments of infantry to be composed of colored men. This was a major change in the policy of the government and broke new ground by permitting black men to serve in the peacetime or regular army. Everybody wants to know how the Buffalo Soldiers was formed and how they got the name Buffalo Soldiers. Well, in 1867 in Fort Hayes, Kansas. Well, first I will tell you there was a whole lot of reasons people give for naming the Buffalo Soldiers. But they generally, they had this battle with the Indians and the Indians was getting the best of them. And so they were treated, and when they treated, one buffalo soldier was killed. And so the Indians seen him, he was all black, and his hair was like the buffalo, and he had the clothes like a buffalo. And so they called them buffalo soldiers. So the 10th Cavalry uh, knew that the buffalo was uh, very special to the Indians because of, they fed them, they, took, they had their weapons, their clothes, and everything, so they decided that they would take that name of Buffalo Soldiers. So the 9th took the name, and then the 24th and 25th Infantry took the name. Whoa. Veterans Day, to me, is it's just probably a holiday for the veterans because in my, 
I, I, uh, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a soldier, period, you know, and, and uh, veterans are probably, they always first class with me, that's 365 days a year. So, you know, these days that they have for the military and stuff, uh, they can't compare to how I feel. You know. I would like to let you know before I go, you know, I told you that I got out of the Army in 1945. Well, after a few years out of the service, uh, I wasn't doing so well in civilian life. I was making plenty of money, but I was spending plenty of money and doing things that uh, you shouldn't do because I was a young man and most young men didn't understand what I'm saying. So I just passed, I was on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn and I passed this sign that says, Uncle Sam wants you. So I says, you know, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going back in the service. So when I was in the army, I was standing knee deep in mud and dust blowing in my eyes and it was night and we had our mess kits and we were trying to find out where the mess was all was throwing the food into your mess kit. We were trying to find out what we had to eat and that was almost impossible. So we did get something to eat and the next morning I woke up and I looked across the street and there was these guys getting out of the bed and going into the mess all eating. And I told her, I says, man, well, who are these guys over there? He said, that's the Air Force. I said, that's where I'm going. <laughs> so when I decided to go back in the service, I went into the Air Force. And when I went into the Air Force, it probably was another great move in my life. I would like to mention to everyone to know that I'm 92 now. And every movement that I made in my life, or what happened to me, I would say that 75 to 95% of it, I didn't know what was gonna happen. So this is where I give uh, God his blessing because he was the one that knew what happened and he probably was responsible for all these moves that were made in my life. And I had a beautiful life. Uh, I can't complain about any. And so the Air Force was one that I credit to the Lord for just sending me there because I did well in the Air Force and uh, I loved it. And I love the military now. I'm 20 years in the service and I finally got to be a soldier. <laughs> With 20 years, I respect all military men. And uh, I respect the people of this country, and I love this country, and God bless this country, and I thank you.